Hello and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective, and today we're looking at chapter 40, 41 and 42 of Allegiant. I can't believe we're in the 40s already, that's a lot of chapters for a shit book. Oh boy, so where we left off, the team decided to stop the Bureau from using the death serum on the Chicago experiment by knocking up everyone at the Bureau with memory serum, but also sending half of the team into the Chicago experiment to inoculate certain people from the memory virus so that Uriah's family can come to the Bureau and say goodbye to Uriah because he's pretty much brain dead. I think that's an accurate summary of what's going on. (laughs) It is a bit confusing, so excuse me if I've got something wrong there. So chapter 40 is a Tobias POV, and he says that Amar agrees to help them get into the city because he's eager for an adventure. And I think he's also eager for some alone time on a road trip with Tobias. So they agree to meet for dinner that night with Christina, Peter and George, who will help them get a vehicle. Who the fuck's George? I don't know. Anyway, so it's a lot of talking and planning instead of just getting going. I suppose they do have like 48 hours up their sleeves because the Bureau wasn't going to mobilize before then. Even though they're ready to go, the planes are on the tarmac, ready to go. And the doctor's given them like 72 hours or 95 hours, who knows? They've got a long time to plan, so they're just having dinner and having a chat about it. But before we get to dinner, Tobias is just in his room, lying down on the bed, stressed about how he's going to talk to Zeke about how Uriah's dying. He feels really guilty about it because he was involved in the plot to overtake the Bureau, which involved a bomb, which Uriah got hurt by. So yeah, it is kind of his fault, but not really his fault. But his big thing is he doesn't know how he's going to bring it up to Zeke, how he's going to explain it, because he also said that he was going to look out for Uriah. But he gets frustrated. So he takes a pillow and he throws it against the wall. And they're in a shared dorm. So, of course, he's not alone. And Kara's is like, um, I thought you were asleep. And he's like, oh, sorry about that. Like, he just pegged a pillow in her vicinity. <laughs> and he's like, sorry about that, Kara. And then he's like, actually, actually, I'm kind of glad you're here. He's like, I've got a question for you. It might be a bit personal though. And she's like, ask away. And he says, so how are you able to forgive Tris after what she did to your brother? Assuming you have, that is. And just to recap, Tris killed her brother. And Kara's mostly over it, but she does think that Tris has a huge nose. And Kara says, well, I I think I have forgiven her. Some days I have, some days I haven't. She says, it's like asking how you continue on with your life after someone dies. You just do it and the next day you do it again. And he's like, huh, did she make it easier for you? I mean, what could she do to help? He's talking about himself, but he's packaging it like he's actually caring about Kara's feelings. I don't think he really cares at all about whether or not she's forgiven Triss. It's, it's all about him. And she's a smart girl. So she clocks it right away. And she's like, why are you asking? Is this about Uriah? And he's like, you got me. And so then she, even though I just called her a smart girl, she comes back with some bonkers logic, really. It might not be bonkers, but okay, let's just go through it. She says, okay, I think the most crucial thing that Tris did, admittedly without meaning to, was confess. There is a difference between admitting and confessing. Admitting involves softening, making excuses for things that cannot be excused. Confessing just names the crime at its full severity. That was something I needed. What? Is there a difference between confessing and admitting? I guess if we're looking at it from a wholly legal viewpoint, then yeah, there might be a difference there. But really, you're splitting hairs. And I know I've made fun of her for killing Will a lot. But in fairness... He was under a simulation. He was trying to kill her. There's a lot of excuses she could be using. Yes, she could have shot him in the foot. We've we've gone down that path before, but if she wanted to make some excuses, she really could. And then Kara says, and also once you've confessed to Zeke, not admitted anything, just only after you've confessed, then you should leave him alone for as long as he wants to be left alone. And that's about all you can do. 
But then she says, but Four, you didn't actually kill Uriah. You didn't set off the bomb that injured him. You didn't make the plan that led to the explosion. So, okay, now she's making excuses for him. She just said, you have to confess, which is the opposite of admitting because admitting involves making excuses for things that can't be excused. But on the other hand, here are some excuses for your admission. And he says, but I did participate in the plan. And she goes, oh, shut up. (laughs) I'm starting to really like Kara. (laughs) She goes, oh, shut up. (laughs) She said, it happened. It was awful. You aren't perfect, but don't confuse your grief with guilt. So then we cut to later, it's the dinner that we heard so much about where they've got to make the plan. Amar tells them when and where to meet. And then they go into a hallway near the kitchens where they won't be seen. And he takes out a small black box with syringes inside it. And it's the memory inoculation serum juice. (laughs) Amar says, there's a chance that we will still be in the city when a memory serum virus is deployed. You'll need to inoculate yourself against it unless you want to forget everything you now remember. It's the same thing you'll be injecting into your family's arms, so don't worry about it. Okay, so they fully told Amar the whole plan. I'm surprised he's so on board with it. I guess I don't think they've told him the part where they're going to spread a memory virus throughout the Bureau. I think they've left that out, but they've told him that they're going to go into the experiment and smuggle people out. And he's clearly on board with inoculating those people. And the theory is that they will then go back into the experiment. But in the meantime, the memory virus will hit the city. So they're going to go back into an experiment and be the only ones that remember the uprising and the Allegiant and everything. Like, what does Amar think is going on? Because if you're Amar in this situation, wouldn't you be like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Why am I inoculating them when that will then protect them, even though everyone's memories are going to be wiped? And if he's just walking around with a box full of needles inoculating people, how come none of them are suspecting that perhaps that the Bureau themselves have inoculated one another from the memory virus? I just don't think anyone would plan to memory wipe a whole city and handle this memory virus without taking those protective actions yourself. It's just all gotten so silly. So they all start inoculating themselves, except for Peter. Four notices that Peter only pretends to inject himself. When he presses the plunger down, the fluid runs down his throat and he wipes it casually with a sleeve. So Four clocks that and doesn't say anything. He's just like, oh, Peter seemingly is volunteering to forget everything. So that's weird. That doesn't get mentioned again, like in the next few chapters, but that's weird. I wonder what he's up to. And so then Christina says, hey, Four, let's go have a chat. So they go for a quick walk where they're alone. And then she says, Amar doesn't know we're going to try to stop the reset. And he's like, no, he's loyal to the Bureau. I don't want to involve him. And yet here he is helping them break into the city, inoculate people, pulling people out of the experiment. But no, he's not getting involved. And Christina says, plot hole, buco problemo. She says, the Bureau's whole reason for resetting our friends and families is to stop them from killing each other. If we stop the reset, then the Allegiant will attack Evelyn. Evelyn will then let loose with the death serum. And then everyone's going to die anyway. She's like, don't you think that's weird? Like your parents are in the experiment. Don't you care? And he's like, no, I don't actually care about them at all. And she's like, oh, that's weird. They're your parents. And he's like, yeah, I hate them. And she's like, okay, well, that may be the case. But if we stop the reset, then they're just going to kill each other. Like, how are we happy with this? She says there has to be a way to prevent a huge blow up that doesn't involve forcibly erasing everyone's memories. Yeah, you'd think. You'd think that would be a last ditch effort. And Four says, maybe I concede. I hadn't thought about it because it didn't seem necessary. What? Why have you not thought about it? How does it not seem necessary? And he's like, huh, well, now that you've mentioned it, maybe we should brainstorm some ideas. Do you have an idea for how to stop it? And she says, well, it's basically your parents fighting each other, mate. She says, isn't there something you can say to them that will stop them from trying to kill each other? And he goes, you're joking. He says, you don't know them, obviously. They don't listen to anyone. And then he's thinking, huh, if I had different parents, if I had reasonable parents, it could work they might be compelled to listen to their son. And then he goes, unfortunately, I do not have different parents. And then he's like, wait a tick. 
But I could, I could if I wanted them. Just a slip of the memory serum in their morning coffee or their evening water. Okay, well, let's just unpack evening water. What, what, what's it? What's an evening water? Is water not an all day drink? Are we on rations in the experiment? I guess I've never paid much attention to their water intake, but maybe they can only drink water in the evening and coffee in the morning and that's about it. Or maybe they do drink all day long, but they've made a big thing of an evening water. Like, oh guys, I can't wait for my evening water. How delicious. May I join you for your evening water? Like, is it a ceremonial thing? I don't know. Okay, so he says, (laughs) I'm gonna slip memory serum in their morning coffee or evening water. Then they could be new people with clean slates unblemished by history. They would have to be taught that they even had a son to begin with. They would need to learn my name again. And he's like, it's the same technique we're using to heal the compound. I could use it to heal them. And he says, that's it, Christina. I've got it. Get me some memory serum. Okay, so let's get this straight. They're all activated because they want to stop the memory virus from being used. And so to do that, they're using the memory virus on the compound and now also on the very people that they just talked about stopping the memory virus from being used against. I just love how it's reprehensible in one breath, but then he's like, you know what? I'll use it. So he says, Christina, while you, Amar and Peter are looking for your family and Uriah's family, I'll take care of it. He says, I probably won't have enough time to get to both of my parents, but just one of them will do. Uh, no. I'd probably aim for the one with the death serum on hand. I'd probably aim for Evelyn. And even if Evelyn forgets about the death serum, does she not have like a second in charge? You can just be like, oh, I know where the death serum is. She told me earlier. I'll just go and use it against the Allegiant. And if he uses it against Marcus, for example, the Allegiant will still be under attack from Evelyn and Joanna and the other Allegiant will still fight back. I don't know why he thinks he's brokering a peace. Like, how can you get someone who's just had their memory wiped be like, oh, everybody, everybody, I know I'm the leader, even though I don't have memory of me being the leader. And let me just say, stand down. How would this work for, how does this work in your head? I don't get it. And also, isn't the memory serum locked up in the vault anyway? We've got to solve that problem first. The vault where the death serum will be released if anyone tries to get into it. But Christina, who's having this conversation, she doesn't bring up any of those issues. She just says, how are you going to split away from the group? And he says, I don't know. We need a complication. And she says, all right, I'll ask to go to the bathroom while we're driving to Chicago. And then I'll slash the tires. And then we'll have to split up so you can find another truck. And he's like, that's perfect. Nothing can go wrong. And she says, yep, that's going to work. And she says, so you're really going to erase one of your parents' memories? And he says, what do you do when your parents are evil? You get a new parent. (laughs) Okay. And then the other one's still evil, but okay. He says, if one of them doesn't have all the baggage they currently have, maybe the two of them can negotiate a peace agreement or something. Like, no, I don't think someone who's just had their memory wiped, who doesn't even remember their own name, is going to be able to negotiate a peace. And Christina frowns at him for a few seconds, like she's about to say something, but then she just nods and doesn't say anything. So you can bet she's thinking like, that's stupid. But anyway, that's where we end the chapter. Then we go to a Tris POV. She's in the storage room of the basement and she's talking to a small group about how they need to break into the weapons lab, but whoever does that is effectively going on a suicide mission because of the death serum. And so Matthew's involved, you know, that famous character, Matthew, he's the lab tech that's been helping them. He says, the question is, is this something we're willing to sacrifice a life for? Oh, and she says, this is the room, this storage cupboard (laughs) is the room where Matthew, Caleb and Kara are developing the new serum. I think that was like a truth serum that works against divergent people. Like who really cares about that anymore? So they've pushed that plan aside. She says vials and beakers and scribbled on notebooks are scattered across the lab table in front of Matthew. And then she also says the string Matthew wears tied around his neck is in his mouth now and he chews it absentmindedly. Okay. All right. That sounds delicious. This is the guy we're trusting to make serums and antidotes and things like that. The guy who's chewing on a string around his neck. That's bizarre. So Tris is saying it's not just about revenge. 
It's not about what they did to the abnegation. It's about stopping them before they do something equally bad to the people in all the experiments, about taking away their power to control thousands of lives. And Kara says, is it worth it? One death to save thousands of people from a terrible fate. And to cut the compound's power off of the knee, so to speak. Is it even a question? So she's saying, yeah, it's worth it. Even though she's not considering the fact that if they do stop the reset, yet, yeah, like we've just explored, the city's still going to tear itself apart. The death serum still looms. And Triss is like, oh, classic erudite. Oh, that's an erudite way to think. Weighing a single life against so many lifetimes and memories. Drawing an obvious conclusion. Oh, classic erudite. But she's like, it's not that easy. And so she's like, the question is, who's going to do it? Who's it going to be? And then she just starts staring at Caleb. (laughs) And she doesn't say anything out loud, but she's looking at him and she's thinking, it should be him. He should be the one to die. (laughs) And then Caleb's like, oh, geez, he can read the room. He's like, oh my God, come out with it. You you want me to do it. You all do. And they're like, oh, no, (laughs) no. Matthew spits out the string necklace that he's been chewing on. And he says, no, no one, no one said that, Caleb, even though they all think it. And Caleb's like, you're all staring at me when you're asking who should be the one to go on a suicide mission. What else am I meant to think? He says, I get it. I'm the one who chose the wrong side, who worked with Janine. I'm the one none of you care about. So I should be the one to die. And then Triss gets on her high horse as if she wasn't just thinking that it should be him. (laughs) She doesn't admit slash confess that. She just says, oh, Caleb, why do you think Tobias offered to get you out of the city before they executed you? Huh? Because I don't care whether you live or die, because I don't care about you at all. She's being all sarcastic, but she's acting like she's the one that went and saved him. But you, no, Tobias did all of that. And yet you were just thinking about how you wanted him to die. <laughs> and Caleb's like, I see it. I see it. Every time you look at me, I see your hatred for me. And at no point does she deny it. <laughs> and he says, Beatrice, okay, if I do this, will you be able to forgive me? And now if she really didn't want her brother to die, she'd be like, no, don't do this for forgiveness. I want you to live. But she just goes, hmm. She says, yeah, I would. If you did go on this suicide mission, I would forgive you. And he says, all right, well, I'll do it. So, okay, Caleb with just no pressure on him at all has signed up to do it. I was wondering how Veronica Roth was going to repair that or at least resolve that Caleb and Triss conflict. And I guess through his death, like that'll do it. So then we have a paragraph break and we cut to a little bit later and Triss is like, wow, that just happened. And she says, Matthew and Caleb stay behind to fit Caleb for the clean suit, the suit that will keep him alive in the weapons lab long enough to set off the memory serum virus. What? Okay, so now we've got a clean suit. (sighs) That's gonna keep him alive for long enough in the weapons lab so that he can activate the memory serum virus. So if clean suits exist, why why is the lab protected by a death serum? I guess it's still a deterrent, obviously, like you don't wanna die, but if clean suits exist, giving you enough time to then wreak havoc once you're in the weapons lab, it just makes me think like, maybe we should just get a few more locks, you know? Maybe get some security. Get one of those laser mazes that are in all those heist movies. Like maybe think of things other than a death serum because clearly they're going to outwit the death serum with this clean suit, however temporarily. And Triss is just resigned to it being Caleb who signed up for the suicide mission. She's walking around the compound and she's thinking, you know, a little while ago it would have been me who would have signed up for that. But nah, wasn't vibing with it this time. She thinks the only reason she signed up for a similar suicide mission last book was because she was overcome with guilt then. But ever since she confessed slash admitted to killing Will, she's, she's not that bothered anymore. She's like, I wanna live. And she thinks, would I really be okay with Caleb dying over someone like Christina or Kara or Matthew? And she says, yeah. <laughs> she says, the truth is that I would be less willing to lose them because they'd been good friends to me and Caleb has not. Okay, she just met Matthew the other day. She already prefers Matthew, the necklace chewer, over her brother. I mean, yeah, her brother worked with Janine, her sworn enemy, uh, blah, 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 but she could be a little bit more forgiving. 
I don't think it's fair to say to someone, your brother, yes, I'll forgive you, but only if you go on a suicide mission. That seems pretty fucking rough. She's like, it's a tough one. I can't sacrifice myself because I'm too busy. She says, in the most honest parts of me, I am able to admit that it was a relief to hear Caleb volunteer. And yeah, he volunteered, but he said, if I do this, will you forgive me? Like, he put the ball in your court, Tris. She's acting like he just signed up on no conditions without any discussion. Eh, you could have stopped it if you wanted to, Toots. So she heads for the dormitory. Tobias meets up with her and he's like, you all good? And she's like, yeah, I feel great, actually. <laughs> she says, I feel like I've already been mourning him. Like he died the second I saw him in Erudite headquarters while I was there, you know? And like, no, he's, he's not dead yet. You can stop this plan from coming to fruition. But she's like, well, I'm already in mourning. <laughs> the body's not cold. And then Tobias tries to comfort her with some abnegation saying. And like, I don't know if he forgets that she grew up in abnegation, but he says, the abnegation have teachings about this, you know? And it's like, yeah, she probably does know. Anyway, if you're interested, apparently the abnegation say that if the sacrifice is the ultimate way for that person to show you that they love you, you should let them do it. What? Why is that a saying? Why is that a common saying? Like, is everyone walking around the abnegation sector being like, oh, you know what they say? Sacrifice is the ultimate way for a person to show you that they love you. How often does that come up? I wonder. I really, truly wonder. And he says, you know what they also say? In that situation, (laughs) that very common situation, apparently, letting them sacrifice themselves is the greatest gift you can give them. What? They have some cuckoo bananas sayings in abnegation, don't they? Like where I come from, sayings are like, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Don't put off until tomorrow what you can start today. Don't eat yellow snow. Like these are all more common catchphrases than the one way to show someone you love them is to sacrifice yourself. And the one way for you to show that you love them is to let them sacrifice themselves. Ah, that old chestnut. And so they're both like, "Mm, yeah. Yeah, all right, that makes sense. She says, I am able to be momentarily placated, knowing that it is something my parents might have understood if they were here right now. (laughs) She's really justifying that she's letting her brother sign up for this. And then he says, this may be a bad time, but there's something I want to say to you. I just want to thank you. A group of scientists told you that my genes were damaged, that there was something wrong with me. And even I started to believe it, but you never believed it, not for a second. You always insisted that I was whole. And she's like, ah, no worries. She's like, yeah, you're whole. You're worth loving. You're the best person I've ever known. And so then they have sex. (laughs) I hate to put it bluntly, (laughs) but that just gets them really going, I guess. Her brother signed up for a suicide mission and he's genetically whole. There's no aphrodisiac quite like it. Oh, okay. So. They have sex, how beautiful. I'm just gonna skip over a lot of that. But she ends the chapter saying, I was so afraid that we would just keep colliding over and over again if we stayed together and that eventually the impact would break me. But now I know I am like the blade and he is like the whetstone. I am too strong to break so easily and I become better, sharper every time I touch him. So yeah, they swap I love yous. He calls her beautiful. She thinks he's beautiful. He makes her sharper. Basically, I think this is just probably the last moment that they're going to be happy. Like I already have that strong suspicion slash spoiler that Triss is going to die at the end of this book. So this might be their last happy moment together. So, ah, well, (laughs) okay, let's move on to chapter 42, which is a Tobias POV. I get that that was a rough transition, but I I do think that might've been the last time we see them together happy just because of the way she was banging on and on about it. Like that was a two page sex scene without them actually talking about the mechanics of sex. It was all like, I fit into him like this. He kisses my belly and says that I'm beautiful. Like it was all flowery, flowery, flowery. Oh, and they didn't have sex in the dorm room that they share with multiple other people. Just so you know, they were in some sort of, well, they were in another room. So this is what I don't get. They're in a hotel an airport hotel and they're all sharing a dorm 
on little cots, even though they're in a building fit to house people. And they were just banging in a hotel room in the smush room of the, of the airport compound. Remember on Jersey Shore how they used to have a smush room? <laughs> a room where no one was designated to sleep in so that they called all have sex on the bed. <laughs> uh, so they just found a smush room and were banging on the couch in the hotel room. Good for them. <laughs> and so he's woken up. They're lying next to each other in the smush room. And he says, we've slept close to each other before, but this time it feels different. Every other time we were there to comfort each other or to protect each other. This time we're here just because we want to be and because we fell asleep before we could go back to the dorm. So yeah, see, I'm getting like, this is their last time together vibes. Maybe I'm paranoid, but that's just the vibe I'm getting. And so he wakes her up. He's all horned up. He wants round two. And she's like, Tobias, we've got some things to do today. And he's like, it can wait. And he starts kissing her and she's like, Tobias. We've got so much to do. Caleb's got to go on a suicide mission. You've got to run into Chicago, break away from Amar, wipe one of your parents' memories while everyone else inoculates Uriah's family and Christina's family because they're the most important characters all of a sudden. And then we've got to wipe the mind of everyone in the compound and start doing propaganda lessons of our own to make them love GDs. She's like, we got shits to do. And he's like, I know, but I want some nookie. And she's like, get out of it. Oh, wait, you know how I just rattled off a list of things that they have to do? That's not even the most important thing, apparently. Tobias says, yeah, we've got to get your brother some target practice just in case. And she's like, oh, that's a great idea. Even though we have a hundred things to do, that's a great idea. Let's get Caleb some practice firing a gun because he's only ever fired a gun once or twice. Why does he need to do this? It's like, oh, mate, I know you're going to die later today, but let's just get your skills up before that happens. I guess they think that when he's going into the weapons lab in his clean suit, he might have to shoot someone. So then, no joke, they go to like a shooting range and give Caleb practice shooting. They teach him how to shoot a gun. I don't know if this is just like a callback or a homage to the Dauntless Initiation training scenes that we got in Divergent. But I don't know why the fuck this is happening. And I also don't know why the people in the compound are just like, oh yeah, yeah, that guy who was just part of a rebel group. It makes sense that he's teaching someone how to shoot a gun. We're not worried. Is there no one in the compound just watching this being like, huh, that's a bit odd. That's a bit odd that Caleb, bookish Caleb, is learning how to shoot a gun. Oh, well, we've got nothing to worry about. I think if you're that unobservant, you deserve to have an uprising against you. So then they just do target practice. And Caleb's like watching Triss shoot and I guess they're bonding over it. He's like not seen Triss shoot before. And he's like, wow, Triss is pretty good. And she's like, yeah. And then Tobias is up against Triss and he's like holding her stomach. And he's like, remember when I did this in initiation? And she's like, I do. And then they're flirting over the shooting range. Remember that list of things you guys have to do? Why, why are we doing this? Go now. What are you waiting for? Get into the city, inoculate people, get into the weapons lab, let Caleb die. I don't know why we're on a go slow. We've got all the time in the world. So we just get like a three page scene of them doing target practice. And then we cut to, and it says, there isn't much to do after target practice, but wait. What, how is there not much to do? And then we just gloss over this one. It says, Triss and Christina get the explosives from Reggie and teach Caleb how to use them. So we just get one sentence of how Triss and Christina suddenly got explosives from Reggie, the guy who I thought lives in the fringe. Did Reggie come to them or did they go to Reggie? What are the mechanics of Reggie handing off explosives to them? That seems so much more important than target practice. And we just get one line. One measly little line just saying, oh, this happened. How did it happen? Where did it happen? It shouldn't be that easy to get explosives. You can't just throw that away in one little line. And then he says, Matthew and Kara pour over a map, examining different routes of how to get to the weapons lab. Christina and Tobias and Amar and George and Peter, they go over the route they're going to take to the city that evening. Triss, meanwhile, is called to a last minute council meeting. So I wonder what's going on there. 
and Matthew's just running around inoculating people with the memory serum. Again, how come no one in the compound's noticing this? Like if I'm a security person at the compound, I'd be like, huh, that Matthew guy's shooting up a lot of people with needles. Makes me wonder why he's doing that. And I guess he's just got access to the memory serum antidote, but they don't have access to the memory serum virus. That's the thing in the lab. Like, okay. Oh God, I can't wait for this book to be finished. And Matthew even inoculated Reggie. Is is Reggie on the compound? Where does Reggie live? What's his deal? And he's inoculated Nita. Nita's under guard. I mean, they're shitty guards that just let anyone in. But how did he manage to smuggle a, a memory serum needle cocktail into the hospital area where she's under supervision? And no one pulled him aside and said, hey, what are you doing? What, what are you shooting people up with needles for? But we're not just throwing that away. In this little one paragraph, we're just throwing all that shit away so that we don't get stuck on it. Well, guess what, Veronica? I'm stuck on it. And then he says, there isn't enough time to think about the significance of what we're going to try to do. Stop a revolution, save the experiments, change the Bureau forever. This isn't enough time. So Veronica's not going to explore that. That just feels cheap, doesn't it? Oh, there's not enough time to explore how our characters feel about this. So we're just going to let them experience it and not fill us in. So then Four goes to the hospital to visit Uriah for the last time. He's still all in a tiz about that. And then he runs into Matthew. And he's like, oh, hey, Matthew, what are you doing? And he's like, I've just been inoculating Nita, he says at like the top of his lungs. Are they trying to be indiscreet? And then Four says to him, oh, I've been meaning to ask you, why are you helping us with this? It seems like a big risk for someone who isn't personally invested in the outcome. And he's like, well, big surprise. I am invested in the outcome. It's sort of a long story though. Okay, so now we're getting Matthew's backstory, which we've all been begging for. And so Matthew says, there was this girl, she was genetically damaged and that meant I wasn't supposed to go out with her because we're supposed to make sure that we match ourselves with optimal partners. So we produce genetically superior offspring or something. But I was feeling rebellious. So she and I started dating. She convinced me that the compound's position on genetic damage was twisted, but then she got attacked. A bunch of GPs beat her up because she had a smart mouth. And she was pretty badly injured, but one of the GPs was a council member's kid and he claimed that the attack was provoked. So they let that kid off with community service, which isn't surprising because remember, Tobias staged a rebellion against them and they let him off with, I don't even know if he does have to do community service. Tobias is practically scot-free. Anyway, she then died a year later during a surgical procedure to try and fix some of the damage. It was a fluke, an infection, allegedly. And so the day she died was the day that he started to help Nita. He didn't think her recent plan was a good one though, which is why he didn't help with it. But he also didn't try that hard to stop her. Even though I thought when we experienced that at the time, he didn't know about the plan. And once Tris told him, he was like, oh my God, we have to go and tell David. And he did try and stop her. So I don't know if he's lying or if I'm misremembering, I'm not too sure. Um, but okay, so that's his backstory. He's really opening up to four, which is surprising because I wouldn't imagine four would elicit such a response. And all while he was saying that, four was looking closely at the string that is around Matthew's neck all of a sudden. It had never been mentioned before, but in this last couple of chapters, we've really driven home that Matthew wears a string around his neck and the string is green the color of the support staff uniforms. So I guess he's wearing like a fragment of her old work shirt collar. Is that what I'm meant to be getting from that? I guess so. And so Four, meanwhile, has not said anything while Matthew's been bearing his soul. He goes, I cycle through the things you're supposed to say at times like these, the apologies and the sympathy, and I don't find a single phrase that feels right to me. Instead, I just let the silence stretch out between us. (laughs) How comforting. He couldn't even think of an abnegation phrase like, they say that when the person you love gets attacked, the only way to move forward is to forgive them because that is how you show love to the common man. Like he doesn't come up with that like famed abnegation saying, I don't know. 
And then Matthew says, oh, and by the way, I would have volunteered to die instead of Caleb, if not for the fact that I really want to see them suffer the repercussions. So Matthew, little quiet Matthew, who's just been chewing on a string, he's now really, really bearing his soul in saying how much he hates the compound. He wants to watch them suffer. He says, I want to watch them fumble around under the memory serum, not knowing who they are anymore, because that's what happened to me when she died. It's like, whoa, that's kind of not what we were saying earlier. We were saying we were going to knock them up with the memory serum so that we could unpack all of their learned propaganda and make a better society for genetically damaged people. But no, he just wants to see them suffer. And so then Matthew just says, all right, well, I'm off. He says, sorry for what happened to Uriah, by the way, I'll leave you with him. And he just goes off. He just walks down the hallway and that's the end of that chapter. Well, wasn't that bizarre? I don't trust this Matthew. I don't trust him. We've just found out that this guy's been shooting people up with memory serum all day. And then he goes on this really big tirade. And he's shown a different side of himself. And now I'm thinking, should we be trusting this guy? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I have my suspicions. Anyway, let's leave it there. I'll catch up with you guys next week. Bye. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations, and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to breakingdownpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at podbreakingdown and Instagram at breakingdownbadbooks. You can visit www.breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch, and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash breakingdownbadbooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading. 